Twenty years after Jesus' death and resurrection, the newly formed church in Corinth was in trouble. Corinth was a large city with many different kinds of people, with different cultures. The followers of Jesus came from different economic and religious backgrounds. They hadn't yet learned how to get along with one another and how to share among themselves. Apostle Paul scolds them in the 11th chapter of the first letter to the Corinthians. He writes, When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? If Paul were writing that letter to us today for the same reason, he would be reminding us of the mission initiative to abolish poverty and end suffering and telling us it is always relevant to how we understand and interpret our sacraments. After scolding the Corinthians, Paul's letter reminds them of the original Lord's Supper and its meaning. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is the oldest account we have of the Lord's Supper, written before any of the Gospels were written. Notice how it begins, on the night when he was betrayed. The fellowship of the disciples was breaking up. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter would deny knowing him three times. The disciples would run in terror at Jesus' arrest, and many would hide from the authorities during and after the crucifixion. In the midst of betrayal, rejection, and broken relationships, Jesus initiated a ritual of remembrance and unity. I can imagine Jesus facing death and thinking, how can I help them remember? How can I help them come together again when this is all over? To be a loving, forgiving community, living out the enduring kingdom principles that I have taught. So he took the most common elements of life, those that were easily available every day, ones that already had historic significance for the Jewish followers, a meal with simple bread and wine. Jesus turned them into reminders of his life and death and asked his followers to remember those things every time they ate the bread and drank the wine. Remember what I taught and demonstrated about the kingdom of God. Remember that you were a community of love and grace, and you can form that community again. Remember the dream of a better world, a dream we worked for and shared with others. What better symbol of Jesus' teachings than table fellowship? So many of the stories of the Gospels speak of Jesus sharing a meal with people whom others had excluded and marginalized and teaching kingdom principles as he ate with them. He visited Zacchaeus in his home. He fed the 5,000. The disciples plucked grain as they traveled through the fields listening to Jesus' teachings. Mary washed Jesus' feet with her hair as he sat at table. In Simon the leper's home, and in many other stories, the table became a place of grace and inclusion, a place to welcome those whom others rejected, a place for the broken humanity who needed to hear of God's grace and God's welcome to all. Communion comes to us in the midst of brokenness, broken lives and relationships, broken health, broken dreams. Communion can restore and make whole your relationship with God and with one another. 
because God uses broken things. God used a broken alabaster jar of spikenard in the hands of a repentant woman to anoint Jesus' feet. God used Peter, broken and weeping in the courtyard after denying his Lord, to lead a raggle-taggle band of broken disciples who had no hope until the Spirit came. And they went on to start a worldwide movement of which we are a part. God used a broken body on a cross to share with us how important it is to love one another and forgive as God forgives. God used the broken seal on an empty tomb to proclaim resurrection and new life in the midst of despair. New life is always possible. God offers to all of us the possibility for new choices, new attitudes, new direction in life. Resurrection is not a one-time only transition between this world and the next. God offers resurrection to us over and over, every month in communion, every week as we serve others, every day and every moment as we turn to God in love, repentance, and commitment. That is what God's grace is all about, a grace far wider and deeper than we humans can comprehend with our small minds. In communion, God uses broken things, broken bread, blessed and given, broken wine, grapes crushed, blessed and given, people who are broken and bruised, crushed, with lives that are not perfect. Our brokenness is built into our personality, our flaws, our habits of doing and not doing. Our brokenness is expressed in our failure to see clearly, to act decisively, to minister perfectly. We are broken in our inability to change, to repent, to offer forgiveness and to receive it. Our brokenness is found in our imperfect organization that we love, cherish, and critique as community of Christ. Any institution that says it is not broken is not being truthful. We bring it all to God and offer our imperfections trustingly into God's hands. And we are blessed and given to one another and given to the world as a community trying to express what God is all about, what grace and peace look like. For this is God's table, not mine, not yours, God's. It's God who invites us and says, come just as you are, imperfect, broken. Come to the table. Come in the midst of your feasts and celebrations. Come in the midst of your betrayal. Come in the midst of your crucifixion. Have you been baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ? Come to the table because you are welcome. Come to remember that covenant you and I made that God will be our God and we will be God's people. And we will try once again not to confuse the two. Today, as you remember your baptismal covenant, as you remember the wholeness and the new life that God can give, claim your vision of what God can do. Say within your heart, here I am, God. Transform me. Help me be all I can be. I want to be Christ's disciple, doing good in the world and demonstrating the kingdom. Help the church be all that it can be. That's what we yearn for and work for. Oh, sometimes we get complacent or tired. Sometimes we need the Spirit to stir us from placidness into passion and witness. But really, God, that's what we want. We want a revitalized church, a living witness that demonstrates grace and mercy so compellingly that others will respond to our invitation to join in the great and marvelous work. The communion table is an invitation to new life. Start over again. Let go of the things from the past. 
things that interfere with the baptismal covenant you made with God. Grab hold of the vision of what can be, the kingdom of God Jesus spoke of. Signal communities, the Zion of old. It's all the same thing, the call to build the cause of Zion, to promote communities of joy, hope, love, and peace. Hold in your heart that heritage, that image, that calling, and remember your baptismal promise to help bring it into reality. Come as you are, broken, wounded, vulnerable, less than perfect, to be reunited once again into a community that can transform the world. God uses broken things, you and me, and gives us life, new life, daily resurrection. Come, God's table is waiting.